Everyone and everything in the world is fallen away from its real being. It's convenient. It's easy to be inauthentic. Just go along with the program. Everybody else is doing it. Traditional philosophy simply describes our condition of being in the world and maybe offers some coping mechanisms to help us feel better about it. But it doesn't really change anything because it doesn't address our being. The cause of all this is the structure of being in the world. It's not anybody's fault. We can't blame them. We can't make them wrong for it because that's just the way the world is. We're thrown into this situation and we have a tendency towards falling into it again every time we try to get out. The bias of being in the world is towards impersonalism, seeing other people as objects and other people seeing you as an object. Impersonalism is a mode of monism which itself is disguised duality and it leads to being thrown into this state where you're simply treated like a tool. Uh, we keep looking for ourselves in other entities and phenomena but we're not going to find ourselves like that. We have to do self-reflection in an authentic way to come to our real being. Look up pernicious any good dictionary will do. In this world, inauthenticity is the default. Without some process, you will not be able to reach your authentic being. Because the inauthenticity is the default, it is considered ontologically as a modification of inauthenticity. And if we think that we're being authentic, we're really just being phonies. Because if you really look into the matter, you'll see that everything you think is you is something you got from outside. Some possibility that anybody could have. So the problem is that we can't see that we're fallen away from our authentic being. We think we're being real. But our reality is borrowed. It's not authentic. Curiosity is simply wanting to know about something, wanting to hear the claims about it, and not really inquiring into its being. So some people go into analysis and they spend years in analysis. When you've heard the paralysis of analysis, that's because simple skepticism without some process of attaining authenticity will simply mask your inauthenticity behind a screen of so-called self-inquiry that really doesn't go anywhere. The same with philosophy. Philosophies that are not based on some kind of phenomenological process are not grounded in authentic phenomena and they can't lead you to your real being. Our thrownness begins from our birth the birth experience is tremendously traumatic. We're squeezed out like toothpaste through a tube. We think we're going to die. The pain is intense. The birth trauma encapsulates all the feelings and moods of that moment deep into our body. It's actually imprinted on the body, the cells. So we're overwhelmed by being in the world. When a baby elephant is growing up, they put a big chain on it, big heavy chain, and the elephant can't possibly break it. So at some point, the elephant decides, okay, I can't get loose, that's it, and they stop trying. And then even when they grow up, the same little chain that they use on the babies will keep a big elephant in check because they think they can't get away. We think the same thing. We think, well, inauthenticity is the way the world works, so I have to be like that. So the first step of the process of recovering our authentic being is to hold our inauthenticity in a different way. That, oh, this is only one way of being out of many, many possible ways of being. It just happens to be the way I turned out. 
in inauthentic being, our energy and attention are fragmented, scattered over many different objects. We don't ever have our full energy and attention on any one thing. That's part of the problem, and the solution is to collect our attention and energy and focus it on our real self. So where is the door to that process, to our real self? What is the process? How do we knock on that door and get it to open? That's what we're here to talk about. It's not a simple thing. It has a lot of aspects to it. It takes a lot of talking about it to get you to see it in your own experience, which is what this is about. The goal is a unified realization of authentic being, but that's very high. We're putting the bar very, very high here. If you can attain that in the way that we define it, then you pretty much have life all sewn up in the bag. But this is very high, and it's going to take a big piece of work to get there. Now, it might sound like we're down on everybody. Huh? We reject traditional philosophy, we reject the everyday way of being in the world, and so on. But actually, we're not. We're like a doctor who comes in and says, you know, son, the problem is you don't have authentic being. Because we have to diagnose you before we can continue the treatment. That's the problem. Most people don't think they're sick. Our underlying unity if we can find it, is very, very powerful. If we can take all the separated, fragmented parts of ourself and reunite them into a unified being, we're much more powerful than in our fragmented state. So the first step of this process is being authentic about the fact that we are inauthentic. Admitting and sharing and taking the stand that I am an inauthentic being. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, my name is David and I'm an inauthentic being. Anxiety is another big topic in our work. And here we see that it also has a triple structure and we've put it on the triple diagram. Um, everyone is in anxiety. And we go through so much trouble to get rid of it but actually we can't get rid of it and that's a good thing because anxiety leads us towards our real being it leads us toward unity by counteracting the fragmentation of our being this self dispersal plus absorption in the world leads to oppression and the oppression is the actual source of the anxiety oppressed by being in the world so anxiety is actually the perfect description of our inauthentic being because in inauthentic being we are oppressed by being in the world. But if we encounter our anxiety authentically, it can silence the voice of the other. All those things that pull us in so many different directions and focus our attention on our real self. In the world, we have problems without solutions. The news, gossip, conspiracy theories, politics, stuff going on the, on the other side of the world that has nothing to do with us. Why do we care about it? Why do we get ourselves in anxiety about it? Well, we're already in anxiety. And the news and like that simply provides convenient objects for us to project our anxiety on and forget that it's actually part of our default being. Look up the word contingent in any good dictionary. We're thrown into the world, into a situation that we did not choose or determine. Yet, we have to choose one of the possibilities that is available in that situation and act on it. And then we don't get to choose the circumstances into which we're thrown. We don't get to choose the set of possibilities that we're thrown into, but we do have to care enough that it turns out right. 
and of course we're always going to look back and say well if I had done it that way it would have been better or if I had done it this other way then so and so would have been pleased with me and you can't satisfy everybody that's just the way it is so we're oppressed by the entire world or actually by being in the world the thing that's cool about the contingency of our being is that actually we could have been any other way including authentic so this idea that our being is contingent is actually the key to our freedom so in our anxiety we are anxious about the world that means concerning the fact that we are thrown and can't choose and we're also anxious for being in the world because we want it to turn out according to the expected norms when we look at ourselves in anxiety we are anxious about ourselves concerning ourselves in the face of ourselves when confronted with our own being because our own being is also something we didn't choose the way we just turned out when we confront our anxiety authentically it reduces our fragmentation because it turns our attention on ourself instead of being scattered all over the being in the world we begin to confront our authentic self that we are in a field of activity and we have responsibility for that field and that field has a boundary within that boundary we can be our authentic self it reminds us that our being is actually an issue for us that we didn't choose the way we just wound up it was because of circumstances we're contingent so anxiety shows the claims of the other to be insignificant because even if we satisfy one or two of those claims the other ones are still going to be unsatisfied and that's because no one else can feel our anxiety therefore our anxiety is our own we are an individual we're separate from all others and we're not responsible for other people's anxiety only for our own so guess what anxiety is our friend it brings us back from lostness and scatteredness and fallenness it reminds us that we're in trouble in the world being in the world is not our real state it's not our real being it reminds us that inauthenticity and authenticity are both possibilities for us and it also distinguishes the other as not ourselves by distinguishing our own individuality as the one who feels our anxiety now in the default state of being we hear idle talk and it allows us to project our anxiety upon other objects that's inauthentic so when we confront the fact that we are anxious about the world itself as a whole that's when we begin to feel our own being as a whole and that is the next step of the process of attaining authentic being now once we realize that we're the ones who are feeling anxiety we start to realize that we're projecting ourselves we're thrown into the world and we care too much about the other we care way more than necessary about the other and we use the other to distract ourselves from ourselves that's what it means by burying ourselves in the other that we don't want to acknowledge that we can be more than what we really are and as long as we care about the world we can never be all that we can possibly be we can never be fully at home in the world and we can never be fully at home in ourselves so here's another triple it would help if you diagram these out for yourself and you can use our triple diagram or you can use the regular RTF triple diagram that of course you looked up in the last video right in this case we're talking about care 
And care, the subject is our thrownness. The object is our projectiveness. And the relationship between them is fallenness. And the three of them to go, go together to make up care. You could also say that the uh, subject is being in the world. The object is being ahead of ourselves. And their relation is being preoccupied with the other. All of those combine to take us away from our authentic self and make us absorbed in the world, scattered throughout the world, so that we are led away from our real authentic self. Now, the problem with our analysis so far is that it has been static. It doesn't include consideration of time. And we'll get into that in the coming sections. But so far, what we've established can be an ontological basis for our analysis of being in time. The analysis of care does give us a unified ontological structure of being in the world. And this is practical. If we can observe our own life and realize that to care means to be in anxiety about the world, but actually this anxiety does not have a present-to-hand object, then we have taken a step towards our authentic being. Look up solicitous in a good dictionary as check out the Latin derivation that links it with anxiety. Uh, there are also some other specialized terms here. Ready-to-hand means that an object is available for experience or use. It's right before us. Present to hand means that an object is observable for thinking about. It's not actually ready to use, but it's, it's around. It's within our awareness. And the world and everything in it does matter to us. We're not going to say, ah, we don't care. Huh? That's uh, taking skepticism a little too far. But uh, we do want to relate to the world from our authentic being and not our inauthentic being. So getting caught up in care about the world to the point where we get absorbed in the world is the way that we fall. That's how we leave our authentic being and become inauthentic. So the way out of inauthenticity begins with being straight with yourself about the fact that you're in anxiety, about the fact that you're fallen, about the fact that you're being inauthentic, and also being straight with others, especially those who are trying to help you out of this trap. So authenticity begins from being authentic about our inauthenticity, because in our default state of being, inauthenticity is all we've got. So our process at this stage is looking into your experience to identify your inauthenticity and then being straight about it, being authentic about the fact that you're inauthentic. That's where it starts. That's how you begin to discover what you care about, how much you care about it, and what you're willing to do about it that does not compromise your authentic being. And we'll get into that in the exercises coming up. Exercises. Observe and verify in your own experience the following. Inauthentic philosophy. Objectless anxiety. Impersonalism. Being fragmented or scattered. The voice of the other thrownness, problems without solutions.